Good morning, everybody. Welcome to yet another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I will be hanging out with you today as we are nearly done with the Origins of Life series. I got this video, one more, and that's it. Our topic for the day is going to be the three domains of life and prokaryotes. So as always, let me get you your objectives, and we'll go ahead and get going. By the end of this video, you should know or be able to do the following three things. First of all, understand changes to the grouping of organisms through history. Second, recognize basic features of prokaryotes. And finally, describe the basic difference between bacteria and archaea. So let's go ahead and start talking about a few things. First thing is classification, which we've talked a lot about classification, and I want to finish up with this. For a long time, since the time um, scientists began grouping organisms all the way up until the 1960s, all living organisms were, group, were put in two major categories, plants and animals, even as scientists discovered single-celled organisms, protists, things like that, they still grouped them as plants or animals. If the single-celled organism was, I don't know, predatory and able to move about, it went into the animal kingdom. If it had chloroplasts and was photosynthetic, it went into the plant kingdom. Never mind the fact that there are a lot of protists that have chloroplasts but are also carnivorous and modal. So as you can see, as scientists gained more data and more information about the organisms they were studying, they rapidly realized that the living world was nuanced. You couldn't just say things are either in the plant category or the animal category. There are actually many more categories than that. So they moved from two major kingdoms, plants and animals, to three domains. And here's kind of how the thinking went. First, they went from two kingdoms to five kingdoms. The five kingdoms that they identified were the Monera, Monera prokaryotes, protists, plants, fungi, and animals. And <clears throat> that was a pretty good system. It stayed like that for a long time until scientists started to look more deeply at the prokaryote kingdom. They realized that in the prokaryote kingdom, which is all single-celled, simple organisms, within that kingdom there was a group of organisms that were very much different from the other ones. You could divide this kingdom in half. And the ones that were different, kind of the outliers, shared some characteristics with eukaryotes, but also characteristics with prokaryotes. So scientists finally decided that the best way to divide the living world up was into three major domains. And if you remember yesterday, a domain is above a kingdom. So the three domains of life are now the archaea, eukarya, which are eukaryotic organisms, and prokarya, which are prokaryotic organisms. Also know the archaea are also prokaryotes. So that figure on the right shows three major domains of life. Interesting thing to note is the branches that, that are red, land plants, animals, and fungi, are the only multicellular organisms. So if you look there, most groups of living organisms on Earth are single cells or unicellular. Let's talk about one group of, the, of, or sorry, of these single-celled organisms, the prokaryotes. Now, prokaryotes are both in the prokaryotic domain and the archaea, but these organisms are the most diverse organisms on Earth. They have been around the longest, probably roughly three and a half billion years, which means that the prokaryotes have had three and a half billion years to gain adaptations and diversity. So they are extremely diverse when it comes to their forms and functions and how they live and how they how they do their thing. So we're going to start talking about some of that stuff. But before we get into that, we need to talk about some basic characteristics of prokaryotes that you need to be aware of. First thing is, all prokaryotes can be divided into two broad categories. Gram-positive and gram-negative, we'll talk about what that means in a second. But what it is, is there was a guy by the la last name of Graham who came up with a technique for staining prokaryotes. And the interesting thing about prokaryotes is they have a cell wall. Now, n unlike the cell wall of a plant, cell wall of a plant is made out of a carbohydrate called cellulose. The cell wall of prokaryotes is made or contains a substance called peptidoglycan. And based on the composition of the cell wall in a bacteria, they will stain different colors. So if you use the same procedure on the same staining procedure on a group of bacteria, half of the bacteria, or not half, but the bacteria that are gram negative will stain pink, and those that are gram positive will stain purple. Now the ones that are gram positive have got a lot of peptidoglycan in their cell wall or in their structure. The ones that are gram negative 
don't have so much at all. So it's that peptidoglycan that picks up the purple stain. Using this technique, um, scientists can easily divide prokaryotes into those two broad categories and then start working from there. Now, based on those two broad categories, and you can see here on the right-hand side, I want to note a couple things for you. We've got a gram-positive prokaryote, and we've got a gram-negative prokaryote. Now, gram-positive pro prokaryotes, you can see they've got this huge layer of peptidoglycan, big old cell wall, on the very outside. That is their outer layer. On a, a prokaryote that is gram-negative, you can see their peptidoglycan layer or their cell wall is kind of sandwiched in between some mel cell membranes. So thing to note is that prokaryotes that are gram negative are generally more complex. You can see that their outer structure, their outer cell structure is much more complex than that of a gram negative or a gram positive uh, prokaryote. Gram negative prokaryotes tend to be more virulent in the form of diseases. They are also generally more complex than a gram positive prokaryote. Continuing on with outer structure stuff, some other things to know about prokaryotes. They have the ability, or they have structures that allow them to attach, and they have structures that allow them to move. On our little prokaryote that you can see here in the micrograph, he's got a couple things on him. All prokaryotes have got a capsule. That is an outer layer that surrounds them. The layer is generally sticky, which allows them to attach to things. And also prokaryotes have got these things called fimbriae, which are these little extensions those help them further to attach to whatever their substrate might be. Also, many prokaryotes have got flagella, which are the long things here, and that is all about movement. The flagella help our prokaryotes to move from one place to another. Probably the biggest and most easily defining characteristic of prokaryotes that divide you know, prokaryotes from eukaryotes is prokaryotes internally are much less complex. They do not have membrane-bound organelles, and they do not have like a um, membrane-surrounded nucleus. All right? They're much simpler on the inside. Genetic material in a prokaryote is also usually contained in a series of circular plasmids, which you can see there on the right-hand side. They may have another tangled-up wad of DNA, but they will also have plasmids. So recognize that while some prokaryotes have also got membranes on the inside that allow them to carry out some metabolic functions, they don't have all of the neatly organized organelles that a eukaryotic cell has. So that is probably the biggest defining factor between the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes is that lack of a membrane-bound nucleus and the lack of organelles on the inside. Final thing, just talking about general prokaryotes, is their mode of reproduction. So all these guys reproduce through binary fission. That's just where they split themselves in half, making direct copies of one another, like a, or not of one another, but of themselves, like a Xerox machine. But they've also got a curious habit where in the absence of nutrients or in really harsh environmental conditions, they can produce what's called an endospore. And what that is, is they will take their genetic material surround it with an outer wall. You can see there on the right-hand side, this thing in the middle of our prokaryote is called an endospore. Genetic material surrounded by an outer wall. And what will happen is this endospore will dehydrate and then just kind of settle in. And you could say hibernate until it is rehydrated and external conditions are favorable. A bacteria can exist as an endospore for centuries. So, you know, in the 1500s, a bacteria could have formed an endospore that is still hanging out in soil somewhere just waiting to be rehydrated and continue its metabolic life as it was before. So it's interesting that these simple, simple organisms are able to produce this thing that allows them to exist over centuries. Final note for the day, the bacteria versus archaea. All prokaryotes can be divided into one of two categories. There are the bacteria and there are the archaea. Bacteria are common. We know about them. We hear about them. They cause a lot of diseases. They're usually what is talked about. Archaea, not so much. The interesting thing about archaea is they are known as extremophiles, which means that they are found in really extreme environments. They've got very unique metabolic, or, um, metabolic strategies, and they can handle things that other living organisms can't. 
Archaea have been found munching on rocks. Archaea have been found in hot springs that are several hundred degrees. They've been found in extremely acidic environments, extremely salty environments. Places where nothing else can live is usually where you find Archaea. And like I noted very at the very beginning of the video, Archaea share characteristics with both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So they are still considered to be a prokaryote because they lack that membrane-bound nucleus and all that good stuff. But based on their unique characteristics and the fact that they are extremophiles, they are divided away from the bacteria. So that is our intro to the three domains of life and prokaryotes. Hope you found it helpful. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.